So I'm going to, thanks, thanks for inviting me back. And I'm going to talk about uh, cloud native, what that means. That's really the why you should be doing this part. Um, then Netflix OSS briefly, the open source tools that we've put out there, and uh, something about the scale and complexity of what we're doing and some benchmarks that we've published over the last few years. So cloud native, what, what is it and why does it matter? Um, well, what happens is we're always striving for, for, for perfection. We want to have perfect code, we want it to run on perfect hardware, and we don't want to make any mistakes when we're operating it. And that's sort of the engineering ideal. That's the utopia we're trying to get to. But that utopia takes too long to get to. So you always ship code with bugs in it, and you always push the wrong button and break it when you're trying to operate it, all those kinds of problems. So there's always this compromise where you're trading off time to market versus quality, and these utopias are sort of permanently out of reach. It's one of those frustrating things about engineering. Just give me another six months, I can make it better. Um, but there's a bunch of markets where time to market is the most important thing. If you're making a land grab, and Netflix is making several land grabs, we're doing a global land grab, we're, we're launching in Holland this fall, uh, we're doing a content land grab, we just announced a deal where we're taking the Weinstein uh, movie output deal uh, in a few years' time, so we're accumulating all of these uh, large-scale content deals, um, and we're sort of disrupting our competitors by... Um, getting inside their OODA loop. And the OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, act. I'll talk a bit more about that later. But if you can figure out how to react to something faster than your competitors, you disrupt the market. And basically, anything delivered as web services, you can just speed it up and go faster and faster. So if you're competing with a service that's delivered on a disk or, or is delivered in some slow mechanism and takes six months or a year between updates, um, you can disrupt them very easily. So this is the OODA loop, uh, observe, orient, decide, act. It came out of the uh, dogfighting in the Korean War. And uh, Colonel Boyd said, basically, it, he was teaching his pilots to uh, figure out what the, 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 um, you know, the people that were dogfighting him were doing and just confuse them by being able to react more quickly. So when you apply this to business, what you really want to do is observe a land grab opportunity. Right, something that somebody else hasn't seen yet. Um, you want, or a competitor makes a move and you want to react to that competitor. Or you find a customer complaining about something and you want to address that pain point. You know, there are other things, but these are sort of several of the different kinds of things where you're just trying to look for an opportunity. Next thing you're going to want to do is do some analysis on it, uh, research alternatives, figure out what to do about that. Then you want to plan a response, get buy-in from the rest of your company, and commit resources to go do something about it. And finally, you're going to implement whatever it is, deliver it, engage customers, market, sales, whatever it takes to get it to the customers. And then there's one more step, which is you back into Observe, where you're measuring the customers and did they actually use this thing and does it make sense. Then you carry on around the loop looking at how the customers reacted to this new thing you did. So the faster you can go around this loop, the, the better you can get your products and the faster you can address a market and you can beat your competitors. So this is, there are big buzz, industry buzzwords sort of that really tie into this. And one of them is innovation. A lot of people have innovation strategies or innovation groups or there are big company memos saying we're not being innovative enough. And what they're really talking about is their inability to see and react to these, these opportunities. The next thing is really big data, and big data is about getting the analysis and getting, um, pulling in the data, the unstructured data, and being able to ask questions that you couldn't previously ask and get answers quickly uh, so that you can carry on to the next step. Um, the decision parts, a lot of this is around corporate culture. If every decision goes all the way to the CEO through layers and layers and layers of management, by the time it gets to there, it's unrecognizable and uh, it takes just too long. So you want to have decision making that is pushed low in the organization and so people can see an opportunity, do their analysis, react to it, and get stuff done really quickly. And cloud is really in this, this fourth box. It's the ability to implement stuff quickly, deliver it quickly, and engage customers quickly. Uh, Cloud-based services like Salesforce or um, you know, real-time bidding, all those kind of marketing and sales operations things where you're very agile. So if we're trying to get around this loop, how, how fast can we get around this loop? 
How soon can we do it? What I'm talking about here is the ability to do code features in days instead of months. We have an idea on Monday. We've implemented it by Friday. The customers use it over the weekend, and we're looking at the data to see what happened on that, the following Monday. And we had a whole series of projects that we did where we cycled 20 or 30 uh, personalization ideas through, the, through Netflix's production systems on that one-week cycle. Uh, so it can be done. We typically take a little bit longer for bigger projects. Like uh, this morning, we launched uh, an update to the what you probably know as the Instant Queue. Um, that was a long project, lots of steps in it. But um, we can get small, you know, small changes and incremental changes made in a few days. When we want hardware, it, get, it arrives in minutes. I'll talk a bit later about some benchmarking we did where we were just talking about minutes to create r really huge NoSQL environments that we could benchmark. Instead of taking weeks, um, having meetings with IT, meetings with finance, meetings with management, trying to get approval. By the time you've done that, you've probably spent as much. If you look at the total salary cost of the people in the meetings, it's probably more than the actual benchmark would have taken if you just ran the machine for a day or ran the set of machines for a day. An incident response, if you're pushing out code very quickly, it's going to be broken sometimes. And you want to be able to tell that something's broken in seconds, and you want to be able to respond in seconds, either automatically or by building uh, visualizations that show you what's going wrong so that you can react in seconds as well. So if, it takes you, if you're looking at one hour updates or yesterday's data, it's already way too late. So this is this new engineering challenge. We're trying to construct a highly agile and highly available service from ephemeral and assumed broken components. So our default assumption is that everything we're talking to and all our dependencies are broken, right? Uh, we don't assume that everything's perfect. And that takes a little bit of getting used to, but that switching that assumption is the key thing here. So how to get to cloud native? The first thing you do is you have to give freedom and responsibility to the developers. That means they can actually observe the the things that need doing. You know, there's probably product managers and whatever in the, in the innovation part, but quite often the developers are there coming up with ideas too. You want to decentralize and automate the ops activities. If you have to go have a meeting with IT to discuss the code you'd like to push to production every time you do that, then you, you can only turn that code over so fast. We're turning code over in a couple of hours from pushing code to all the way through to production. And it's done, we do that because the developers are managing that code into production. They manage it when it's broken, and they understand the exact state it's in at any point in time. There isn't time to explain to the ops guys you know, exactly what the state of the system is at any, um, um, so that they could react to it. And what we've basically done is take this DevOps organization and integrate it into the business organization. So we don't have a separate business, separate engineering, and a separate operations group. It's really one, three, one sort of group I call biz DevOps, or whatever you want to call it. So how do you get there? Um, unfortunately, for most companies, it means a reorg. Um, and that's, that's kind of the bad news. If you either already organize this way or you can figure out how to organize groups and give them the autonomy to operate in this way uh, to maybe build a new product line or something like that. But it's very difficult for organizations to actually respond to this, which is why you know, new organizations come along and disrupt it, and uh, engineers uh, get frustrated in the old organizations and move to organizations where you can actually, uh, where you are, do have this freedom and responsibility. So a lot of it, a lot of the uh, speed comes from corporate culture as much as, any, as much of any, any of the technologies. So these are the four transitions. The first thing, integrating all of your um, management, all your roles into a single organization so that you can iterate around this OODA loop in days rather than having to all these handoffs and, and meetings and taking weeks or, or months to go around it. Developers. Um, this is the one that's actually the hardest transition that we made. The move to cloud was relatively simple. The move from uh, you know, a traditional Oracle, MySQL schema-based environment to a relational schema environment to a NoSQL environment was the hardest thing to actually get the developers' heads around. And one of the things here is that you have to completely denormalize your data model so that every team, what used to be a materialized view or a table that, um, you know, some query talk to becomes a completely distinct database. 
Right? So we have totally separate clusters. We blew up our schema to the point where the back ends are not even in the same cluster. We don't have one huge Cassandra cluster with all of the different tables in it. We have 50 different Cassandra clusters. Yeah, each of those, if you looked back at the way that would have been implemented in Oracle, would have been a materialized view or a table or something, but all part of one big schema. And if you wanted to touch any part of that, the effects would ripple through everything else, and you have to go and bounce Oracle or bounce the database to do the alter tables and all those kinds of things. So we are continuously altering all of our tables because it's somewhat unstructured and also because it's partitioned and denormalized. And, um, People are uncomfortable with denormalized, and you have to get over it. And because of the speed that it gives you, it's one of those things where, yes, it's a little bit broken, but you can build data checkers to clean things up, and uh, you can go so much faster. It also makes it possible to be polyglot. Uh, we have largely Cassandra in our back end, but we do have some MySQL in there. Um, we have occasionally had bits of Mongo in there. Um, there are other databases that you can put in there, and you can experiment, and you can move things back and forth. It gives you some migration abilities. Because once you've broken it up and denormalized it, it doesn't have to all be one big thing because you're never going to try and do a join across it anyway. And then, as I said, we move responsibility from ops to dev for continuous delivery. So that means the developer pushes code when they are ready for it, and then they understand their dependencies and who depends on them. And most, most changes are hidden behind layers of, of abstraction so that you can actually iterate faster. Uh, you can make changes that don't change an interface uh, quite quickly. So we're talking about decentralized small daily production updates by each team. Um, each t you might actually, some teams might update once a week, uh, others may update multiple times a day, but it's very decentralized. And then this agile infrastructure, so the ops to dev. Um, you have to get developers used to pushing their own code and being on call when it breaks. So this is the run what you wrote idea that um, some companies call it. Um, and if you can make a developer be on call, they get very good at not getting called by writing code that doesn't break and building automation to make sure that when uh, something downstream breaks, their code points the finger at it to say that broke rather than just sort of throwing errors itself. So the, um, we get very good habits by taking away the crutch that developers typically lean on, sort of the operations crutch. Oh, they'll deal with it. Now, if you have to deal with it, then you make it better. So inspiration, I've got a bunch of books here. There was actually a uh, blog post today on the uh, Black Duck Software site based off of a previous talk I gave that goes through some of these books. Um, who here knows this book, Release It, from Michael Nygaard? Okay. Too many people haven't put their hands up. Okay, so this is one of the classic books in, in um, how to get code out there in production. We learned patterns from this, that, like the bulkhead pattern and the um, circuit breaker pattern that we baked into our code. So bulkheads prevent failures from spreading. Circuit breakers basically say, this is ba currently bad, stop trying to call it, let it recover, and we'll check it occasionally, and the circuit breakers flip back in. So typically, you know, the same way electrical circuit breakers work. Uh, thinking in systems is, isn't really about computing at all. It's mostly about economics and, and about how to build large-scale, complex, adaptive systems that have the right emergent behaviors. So it's a really fundamental book in this space. Uh, if you're trying to build what looks like a very chaotic system, but you want it to behave in a very stable way, it's important to understand how to build feedback loops and, and things like that. Uh, Anti-Fragile is a book that um, came out last year that talks about how when you hurt things a little bit, they get stronger. And this is the uh, principle that we've been using for a while. Uh, the best analogy for this is if you go and work out, really, you know, do a really good workout, you probably really hurt the next day, right? So that's kind of bad. Why would you do something that makes you hurt? Well, it turns out that you get a little bit stronger each time you do it. And the reason you're working out is to get stronger. And what we do is we work out our systems. We work out the Netflix infrastructure by, by inflicting a little bit of pain on it um, that actually finds the weaknesses and makes it stronger over time. Drifting into failure is, uh, the, the, the best way I like to describe this book is don't read this if you're about to get on an aircraft or about to go into hospital. It's got lots of examples about everybody making the right decision based on the, all the information they had available to them, and you end up with this tragedy of the commons kind of thing where the connection, when you connect together all of these perfectly good decisions, the end is a massive failure. Um, 
where if we keep pushing the maintenance intervals, because the thing's never broken, so we don't need to maintain it very often, and eventually the plane falls out of the sky because they finally went a little bit too far. And it's never done that before, so everyone's all surprised. But there's no actual fault. Nobody is at fault in any part of this. Everyone was optimizing for the right thing. So this, the problem with this that this highlights is that if you build a really, really highly available system and Netflix is run into these kinds of problems, when it does fail, nobody's used to dealing with it failing. So all the things creep up on you, all the sort of technical debt creeps up on you, and then when it fails, the people, the team that's trying to fix it has, hasn't been on a call because the thing hasn't failed for a long time, and you end up with people thrashing around and not knowing what to do. So part of this is to have sort of fire drill type uh, game day type of activities where we practice um, breaking the system in a way which involves the users, the, the developers actually getting cold and having to deal with it. Um, as, we, as we get more and more automation in the system, you, you have to understand what happens when the automation breaks down, basically. And part of that, as you get into the sort of usability thing, is well, whenever you have the incident review, well, it's obvious why it broke. Right? It's always obvious after the event, and the point about this book is how to make it obvious before the event so that when things break, it's obvious what to do about that. Um, our system's built out of hundreds of distinct services. Each of them has a REST API. Um, we let our engineers figure out what API they want. Uh, it turns out that uh, making up how to do APIs isn't really, is, is on your own and from first principles, isn't really a good, good idea. There's lots of bad patterns in there. So the REST API handbook by George Reese is a very good background book, lists all the bad kinds of APIs that are out there. And if you're doing cloud, he, he's been um, interfacing to every cloud API from every vendor that's ever done cloud for, for quite a while. And that's where a lot of this background comes from. Uh, continuous delivery, I've mentioned this a few times. Uh, Jez Humble, in particular, is, a, is a very well known in this space. There's a conference coming up, I think it's November the 1st, called FlowCon. It's the first time it's being held, and it's in Santa Clara, I think, or it might be here, it's somewhere in the Bay Area. Um, it's a one-day conference, first time I'm doing the opening keynote on it, so I'm just trying to figure out how to write that up. But um, very interesting about how to go faster and faster at getting value delivered to customers, basically. And finally, if you're trying to do sort of TCO analysis and things like that, um, Joe Weinman's got exhaustive coverage of all the algorithms and all of the formulas you need to figure out you know, what is the real way to do cost analysis and uh, trade-offs between different kinds of environments. So there's this nice quote that says, genius is 1% inspiration, that was the inspiration, and 99% perspiration. So we had quite a bit of perspiration as well as reading a few books. Um, and we've open sourced our perspiration, way of thinking about it, in this open source platform. Um, if you go to netflix.github.com, you'll find, I think, currently 34 projects that are out there. Why are we doing this? So the goals are to establish these solutions as best practices. If we put code out there and everyone says, that's stupid, I prefer doing it this way, that's really useful information. You can then go and look at the alternatives. So we're testing our ideas in public to make sure we've got the best practices in there. We also use it to hire, retain, engage really top engineers. Um, some of you may have heard of the JClouds library. It's a Apache standards coming out. Um, last, late last year, we were able to hire the guy who has spent the last three years building JClouds as an engineer. He came to us particularly because of our strong support for open source. Um, it's the other, the other Adrian, Adrian Cole. Um, it also builds up the Netflix technology brand, so I get invited to do keynotes at conferences, which is fun. Um, and then we're benefiting from a shared ecosystem as other people are working on our code. Um, we've been engaged recently with IBM, who have done a, a demo port of the, uh, the, Net, the Netflix example application, and they've been working on actually figuring out how to port it to OpenStack and things like that, and SoftLayer and all their environments. So you know, we've got engagement from large vendors like that, and also from end users. The PayPal took some code that, we, that we'd built and repurposed it to work on their internal cloud, things like that. And we're, we're getting benefit from that. We're learning more about um, how, you know, what the weak spots in our code and the missing things that we want to add to it. So that's our perspiration. We've also um, got a cloud price. There's about one month left to run on this. So um, deadline, September the 15th. 
Um, this is to boost the ecosystem. Again, there's information about this on GitHub. Uh, we have 10 prizes of $10,000 for the best contributions to the Netflix open source platform. Um, there's $5,000 of Amazon credit included with all of those, and you get a very geeky trophy that beeps and flashes lights and things like that. Um, and that the prizes will be announced at the AWS reInvent conference in Las Vegas. So the prize winners get to, we'll, we'll announce the nominations and then the prize winners will be secretly told and given tickets to fly to Vegas so they get announced there. Okay. So one of the things that the having our code out there um, gave rise to was some demand for people that wanted to use it in ways that we hadn't been intending to use it ourselves. In particular, we've got some vendor-driven portability here. There was interest in, in using some pieces of our code in these enterprise private clouds. So Eucalyptus, um, basically the last build they did, the last product release they did, they said it's, it's done when it runs the Netflix code and they used us as an extended test suite and added some features. So they started shipping that in June. Um, CloudStack, they, have a, they put up a 10K prize for the best integration, you know, inspired by the fact that we were giving away prizes. So there's some work going on there. And um, with OpenStack, um, there's some vendor and end user interest, and PayPal built a console based on our, our console. So that's kind of um, interesting. You put code out there, people start leveraging it and figuring out other ways of using it. And we're trying to drive that. And it's, but it's largely an experiment at this point. We weren't quite sure what would happen when we open sourced everything and, and had the prize. And it's um, been quite interesting to see what, what the reaction's been. So now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Netflix streaming and the challenges that we have there. So this is a cloud native application. It's, um, but it's based on this open source platform. So we don't really have any enterprise software in our, in our stack. We can scale it as much as we want. We never have to go talk to vendors. We get all our code from GitHub or we write it ourselves. And that's a very different approach to the way that most people build large scale applications. Um, the, the website homepage looks something like this. The way this works is you have your own device, which is in blue, your web browser or your um, TV connected device. That's talking to the, uh, all these yellow boxes which are all running on AWS and the red one, which is our content delivery network, which is uh, our own box. So the first thing that happens is um, you visit the website. There's a discovery API. There's all kinds of personalization, all, all sorts of information needed to figure out what movies to show you. The next thing is you, you choose a movie. You click play on it. Then the streaming API fires up and gives a, the, basically the DRM points you at the right CDN to get the content. Uh, and starts logging information about whether you're having a good time watching it, what bit rate you're using, uh, whether you're rebuffering, and it remembers where you are so that if you stop or you switch to another device, we can continue from the place you were at. So there's quite a lot of logging and a lot of up tra traffic going back into the system. And then the CDN, we, we get all our content from studios, studio partners. We have to encode it into the right format, so that happens on AWS. And then there's a bunch of CDN management and steering backends for controlling and tracking where all this stuff is. And we have a very large number of these boxes scattered around the world providing content. They're, they're like big static web servers. Um, they're a box. Most of them are 100 terabytes in a for you box, basically. And we ship them out to ISPs and peering, peering points. So that we, we do several, well, many terabits of traffic through these, uh, and we basically outgrew the ability of the uh, commercial CDNs to provide us bulk traffic capacity that we need in the, in the way we needed it. So back in November, there was a, a report that said how much bandwidth is being used, and this is the fixed traffic to North America, fixed traffic um, for media streaming at peak time. So this is... No, not media stream. It's, this is the total internet ba bandwidth delivered to people's houses over uh, DSL lines and cable modems and things like that. And Netflix is a third of that traffic. So we kind of like that. Um, and most of our competitors are a long way down the list, so that was good too. Then six months later, they came out with another report. The top line number is up 39%. So the total amount of bandwidth being delivered that they measured averaged across all the houses was 39% more. So this is a very fast growing area. Everyone's got more machines connected, they're watching more, they're getting more bandwidth, um, 
all those kinds of things. And Netflix is still about a third, and our competitors are still mostly small. Um, YouTube's getting big pretty quickly as well. So that's the main other platform. In fact, Netflix and YouTube together is now more than 50% of all delivered bandwidth. So it's quite an interesting way of thinking about it. So if you look at that in more detail, this is what our web server really looks like. Um, it doesn't have those, if you take all those big orange boxes that I had and look, look inside, it's, there's about 20 services behind the web server and it goes several services deep. So in, in order to generate the home page, this is roughly what the, the fan out of, of requests looks like. Some of these nodes are Cassandra, some of them are Memcache. S3 buckets, random things like that. Now, if we lose one of these services because it totally broke for some reason, um, maybe one of the rows on the website stops appearing. Maybe it's the Similars row or the Facebook row or something like that stops appearing. Uh, and the rest of the site still works because we have all of these other services. So let's look at how that works from a NoSQL storage point of view. What we've built is this highly scalable, available, and durable deployment pattern using Cassandra. And the way it works is that we have this single function microservice pattern. And Cassandra isn't the thing in the middle of this, it's the thing in the top right. That's a single function Cassandra cluster. It's probably got one key space on it. It's got maybe a couple of column families. Um, maybe one sort of, think of it as one indexed table. That's logically the, the way to think about it. Maybe a little more complex than that depending on exactly how we're trying to structure the data in it. Our smallest cluster, we deploy six nodes. The biggest ones right now are 144. Um, we have quite a few in the sort of 24, 48 kind of, kind of scale. In front of that, you put a single function REST data access layer service, and everyone goes through that. So all of these things on the left are all the clients that want to get access to this information. They all make HTTP calls to our, to our auto-scaled layer in the middle. Um, and that totally hides the fact that it's even Cassandra. You don't know. It's not, not available to the clients. They're making a REST call. Okay? So we have over 50 clusters following this pattern, over 1,000 nodes in Cassandra. The backups, compressed backups, are over 30 terabytes. And the biggest clusters are doing several million writes a second right now. You also can see this optional data center update flow. The point about this is this gives you a migration mechanism. So if you've got your existing system, it's a big database, big SQL database or whatever, um, you put a data access layer in front of it, and you convert your applications to get everything out of that layer. In fact, you put several in front of it. You take each of these tables and materialized views or whatever you've got, you put a data access layer for each of them. Now, behind that, it's still your big relational database, but now you can put caching, and now you're building against this new world of a fine grain distributed system. And now you can start making copies of this data in the cloud. And that's what we did. That's how we got from, uh, we still have, uh, the DVD business runs on a very large you know, IBM machine with a very large Oracle license and a big SAN and all that. Um, that was the code base we were on four or five years ago. We split it off one piece of functionality at a time into distinct Cassandra, or, or in fact, originally SimpleDB, but we switched to Cassandra clusters in the cloud. So we made a copy of the data in the cloud, and we kept everything up to date. We wrote checking code that would copy things back and forth. And eventually, we turned off the data center access and made the master copy the copy that's in the, data in the cloud. And we now have new functionality that's only in the cloud, and the data centers just has the remains of the DVD business in it which is, I think we have, I don't know, 37 million or something, uh, approximately streaming customers now, uh, 36, 37 million, and something like eight or nine million DVD customers. I, remember, I forget, they, they vary a little bit, but that's basically where we are. Now, when you're building these client systems, so these are the, the systems, these single function REST clients, they're all trying to use Cassandra to do something, or your data access layer is trying to do something. And you end up reinventing the same recipes over and over again. So we started collecting these recipes, and we published them. This is part of our open source project. So for Cassandra, we have a client library called Astanax. It's for Java client library. And these are the, some of the recipes that we have for it. You can see those are fairly high-level operations. Some of them are quite powerful, like um, large file storage. If you want to store a gigabyte-sized chunk or a really, really big chunk 
in a NoSQL database and you store it as a single blob of data, it tends to blow up the database. It, there isn't enough memory in caching and it will, hit, it will land on one node which will probably time out and you'll retry and eventually just fail. What this does is it splits the data into lots of chunks, spreads those chunks over the entire cluster um, and uh, makes sure the chunks are small enough that they, if you fail, you just retry a small trunk. Um, S3 has a similar uh, multi-part write mode, and this is sort of modeled the same way. Um, very powerful, for, and it works for reading and writing the same way. And we've actually, from the Cloud Prize, somebody contributed a high cardinality reverse in, index pat recipe for us. So this is what it really looks like. We have all these microservices. We're testing them. I was talking about anti-fragility. We're testing them with Chaos Monkey. That kills an individual service. Um, we use Latency Monkey, which doesn't kill a service. It makes it slow, and it injects errors into it. So you can get a machine and say, I want you to just return 500s for a while um, and see what happens. Or I want you to respond in 10 seconds instead of you know, 100 milliseconds whatever the normal time would be, just to see what, how, how the errors ripple out and do we have bulkheading properly set up so that you know, the, the consumers of that service should sort of contain the fact that it's now a bit misbehaving. We have Conformity Monkey, which goes around looking at all these services, making sure that they're set up correctly, and we have a bunch of rules that we write that, that basically are the architectural patterns for how things should be set up. And we have a whole lot of other monkeys, too. Um, this one, we have Chaos Gorilla. So we, we, if we take that pattern, we replicate this pattern three times. So we use availability zones on AWS. So we have three zones. We have three copies of all our data. We use a load balancer to randomly pick a zone and make a request to a machine in that zone. And then we use Cassandra and at the bottom to move all the data back and forth and keep everything in sync. And we have a, a, a EV cache is a memcached based replication library that we built that makes sure you have three copies of your memcache, one in each zone. So now we also have a Chaos Gorilla, and um, we actually took, run this in production once a quarter. Um, I was at the no, no, which conference? At Cloud Connect conference in March, and we actually did it during the conference. It was actually the Tuesday of the conference. We ran this in production, took out a third of our infrastructure. Almost 3,000 machines were shut down as fast as we possibly could, and there was no Netflix outage. There were a few errors. We found a few things that weren't quite right, but it didn't cause a customer visible outage. Uh, it, caused, it was basically, this is the anti-fragile stuff in action. We actually are stronger because we run these tests. We run them once a quarter just in case we do get an outage. We don't want to hit the quarterly availability number too hard. But if you do get this, if you lose an entire building because of, you know, a hurricane goes over Virginia or something or, or there's a power outage, what you really just want to do is turn off traffic to it so that you just tell the load balancer, stop sending traffic. We can do continue to run on two out of three. It's a quorum-based voting system. As long as I've got two out of three, all my queries will continue to run. So that gives us a very powerful mechanism to aggregate any kind of failure up to a zone failure. It's like if it's anything at all goes wrong, if I can just hide it, you know, I don't really care what went wrong as long as it only goes wrong in a zone, one zone at a time. And AWS has got better and better at zone isolation. That Some of their outages from two or three years ago were caused by things leaking across zones and um, you know, an outage in one zone just trickling across to the others and they've got better and better at isolating those. So what we're doing also now is isolating regions. Um, we use Europe, EU West, and US. We decided we wanted to isolate those two regions um, so that they're running very independently, but keep the customer data, uh, you know, the fact that you're a Netflix customer is global. So if you travel to Europe, you, your machine, you know, your, your account still works. You don't see the same set of movies because you see whatever movies we have in the UK, but um, your account works. Now, if we lose the connection between the two, because of the way Cassandra works, it's a, a, an AP system. It's a, available under partition. This is a partition. Both sides are available for writes, so all reads and writes continue. And if you happen to figure out how to you know, update both sides at once, then whichever updated latest wins. When, when it gets fixed, it comes back, and it resynchronizes automatically. So this is the powerful, um, this is the thing Cassandra is actually really good at that we've leveraged a lot. Um, if you lose an entire region, the other region keeps running. So that's the key thing. So these are the failure modes that, um, that we're looking at. 
application failure, we expect this to be happen all the time because we're shipping code, and if it's not happening occasionally, then we're probably not shipping code fast enough. Right? So we're expecting that to happen. We want automatic degraded response. Um, region failure is relatively infrequent, but it's happened often enough that we decided that we wanted to be able to switch traffic between regions, and we're working on that now. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Zone failure, it, it's part of sort of the normal operation of, of cloud is that you should expect zone failure occasionally. So we want to continue to run under two or three zones with no impact. Data center failure, we've now moved all our dependencies into the cloud so we can continue run, to run with our data center completely down and we've had that happen a few times. In fact, many of the Netflix outages over the last two or three years were actually data center outages that caused the cloud side to, to fail. One of the last things we moved was uh, hardware security modules, and uh, AWS has HSM options, the sort of safe net lunar boxes that hold all your crypto keys. We were calling back into the data center to get at those keys for a long time, and uh, AWS has that in the cloud now so that we don't have to. Um, if you get a data store failure, so you know, Cassandra corrupts something or our application code scribbles over data and, and then you need to go back to backup. So we have S3 based backups. We're continuously storing stuff in S3. And if S3 fails totally, um, we want a copy of our data that wasn't on S3. So we have one extra copy that we, call, we store in a remote archive um, that is not on S3. We do that sort of a daily update, just sort of, you know, we still have all of that Netflix data somewhere else. So I'm going to talk a bit about Cassandra at scale. And what we've really been doing here is benchmarking to try and retire risks. Uh, as we went out and used, we pushed Cassandra harder and harder, some of these benchmarks were us going, well, how hard can you push it, and, and is this going to work? The first one we did um, in 2011, two years ago, was we were currently running on 24. We maybe just started using 48 node clusters. And the question was, well, how, fast, how far can you scale? And we scaled up to 288 nodes. Just linearly and went, okay, I give up. It's probably gonna to continue to be linear, that's, that's far enough. Um, and what we really came down to is I said, can we get a million writes a second? I don't care how much, with lots of machines. And um, the data stats guys started using it in their marketing. So there's actually this million writes in a second pop-up advert was happening. If you clicked on it, it eventually took you to uh, the blog post I wrote on how we did this. This was using 288 really quite small machines only. Uh, four CPUs, eight ECUs, which is the sort of compute uh, thing. The biggest Amazon integers are 88 CPUs, so this is you know, a much smaller system than um, you could use. A, f a year later, um, we'd got solid state disks, so now we ran a benchmark which compared a non-SSD versus SSD, and we were able to do away with memcached and get basically the same throughput and lower latency but at half the cost, because we could run on such a small cluster of machines compared to how many we needed to keep Cassandra running with regular disks. So that's, we now run, I think, well over half of our Cassandra nodes are SSD-based, several hundred of them. This year, we've got some cross-region use cases. Um, we've been using it for ge geographic isolation, US to Europe, as I mentioned, but we've got a new one. We want to do redundancy for failover between the east and west coast. And there were some people wondering, well, I'm not sure how well that's going to work. Can we trust it? How reliable is it if I write it in California, in Oregon? How soon is it going to get to Virginia? All those kinds of questions. So we decided to run a, a benchmark on this. And this is what the benchmark looked like. Um, it's, we took our most write-intensive cluster, okay, the one that we, we hit hardest, because Previously, we'd only be doing multi-region on read intensive because that seemed like an easier thing to go do. So what's the most write intensive one we could? And it turns out that AWS had enough spare SSD instances at that point in time a few months ago that we actually grabbed 96 of them. And we stood up a 96 node cluster with 48 in Oregon and 48 in Virginia, uh, which took about 20 minutes. Um, and this is off a hallway conversation. There was no like going and arguing with anybody about how much this was going to cost, because um, we only needed it for a few days anyway. So this is 192 terabytes of SSD, um, and fired it all up and running in 20 minutes. So who here can do that? I mean, who here thinks that they can fire up a 192 terabyte SSD Cassandra cluster in 20 minutes? Okay, all of you can. All this code's open source. 
<laughs> it's public cloud. You just download the code, push the buttons, and 20 minutes later, it's running. Really, it's, this is the level of automation we've got, but the, all of this is open source code. There's nothing special here. I mean, it might take a bit longer to get it set up the first time, but, but that's, that's the power of having this stuff up. Um, so I challenge you to go away and build a cluster now. So we've got these two clusters all hooked together. The first thing we did was pull 18 terabytes of backup data into one of the clusters. That took an hour or two to suck out of S3. It's 48 nodes in parallel just pulling data in. Um, each of these nodes is two terabytes of SSD and a 10 gigabit network port. So my bisectional bandwidth across the country is 480 gigabytes, gigabits per second, which is quite a lot, really, um, for the internet. And then we said, well, let's push that 18 terabytes to Aragon and see how quickly it gets there. And we were a little worried about how fast it was going to get there. It might get there a bit too quickly and break something. But actually, it only ran at 9 gigabits, so it wasn't too bad. Uh, that's actually not very much. Um, that's 48 single threads of data being copied over. And we, in, in doing that, the, we used the boundary.com's uh, network monitoring tool to look at all the traffic flows here. And it was measuring a, a TCP round trip latency of 83 milliseconds very stably for this. So that was quite nice. Uh, the boundary, I've got a bunch of graphs I used for boundary, which I didn't have time to include today. So um, we then put test load on both sides. And then we also um, put a validation load where we wrote a million writes to one side and we read them all back from the other side, half a second later. So you write, and then you read back, just to make sure that the data got there and they all got there. So this internally engineering sort of people that it, within Netflix that are a bit dubious about it mostly went, yeah, I guess that's gonna work. Uh, and <laughs> and we're, we've now have this running in test and we're bringing it up in production. So over the next few months, we'll actually be running live before the end of this year. Um, in this mode. A couple more things. We've now got customers that we need to split between these two coasts, so we need to use DNS to do that. Um, but every DNS vendor has a different API or had different features. So we built a library called Denominator, which is the highest common denominator of DNS features. It's a very powerful library, and it's also got a command line tool. And if you're doing any DNS management with any vendor, just go and get this tool. It's a really powerful way of doing it. This is what Adrian Cole's been working on for the last six months, if you know him. He's been having a lot of fun with it. Um, so now if we lose a region, we, a zone, we don't care. If we lose a region, we stop talking to it and send all the traffic to the other region. If we lose a DNS vendor, we switch to a different DNS vendor. We have all of the DNS data abstracted outside it in a, in a globally available uh, Cassandra-backed data store. So what we're trying to do here uh, is get, our, get the problems to go away. So the biggest problem you have is a PR level incident. And a few times a year, there's an outage that's big enough that it makes it into the press and people write articles about it. And that has a much bigger impact on our customers than the actual outage, the outage itself. So you want to avoid anything that hits the public relations impact. Below that, there's probably 10 times as many that actually cause customers, people to call CS. We don't want those because Customers that call CS are more likely to quit Netflix. So we want to keep people happy. You never want to push them to the threshold where stuff doesn't work. Um, and then below that, there are ones that, cause, that just affect the quality of what you got in the test results. So by active, active, and game day practicing, we're trying to push down incidents that would otherwise have been PR incidents to be just CS incidents. And then by better tools and practices, get the things that would have been CS incidents and move them down to be just feature features that got disabled. Um, and then by better data tagging, we can take all the feature disable and have clean data on what who actually saw which feature when we're doing all of our A-B testing analytics. So that, that's kind of the way to think about that. OK, I've just got a couple more slides. Um, Cloud security is always a big question. I don't, there's a whole presentation on this um, that I've linked to here from Jason Chan. Um, if you go to slideshare slash Netflix, slideshare.net slash Netflix, you'll find lots of these. But one of the things we do is automate our attack service monitoring. So we, whenever you create a new S3 bucket, there's a thing that will go and find that you've created it and check the permissions and make sure that they're correct. Whenever you push new code, we automatically do a penetration test against it to make sure that it's good code. And we'll send you a little note saying, by the way, we're testing it. Your logs might have filled up. Um, I talked about Cloud HSM. Key management's really critical. And then the other thing is that AWS is at such a large scale that a lot of the concerns you have about DOS attacks and things are really mitigated by the Amazon layer. 
Um, so, managing scale and complexity. These impossible deployments, things like, hey, I need 200 terabytes of SSD um, in 20 minutes, and I just thought that up. Um, that's not really possible any other way. We're jointly building code with partners in public. Our Cassandra work was done jointly with people from lots of other companies. Um, the denominator DNS management, we've been working very closely with uh, the Ultra and Dyn and Rackspace and HP and the support for a bunch of other DNS backends that we don't use ourselves. Um, and this gives us this highly available and secure system despite the fact that we're, we're running at big scale and we're running really fast. So here's um, some links to various things. We've got, um, we've got some blog posts of the meetups that we've done. Um, where we had contributors and different lightning talks talking about the individual projects. You can't read the URLs, but the slides will be out and about. And if you're particularly interested in cost-aware monitoring, uh, how to optimize costs on AWS, I did a joint talk with Janesh Varia, which is actually on the AWS cloud uh, slide share site rather than the Netflix one. Um, okay, so final slide. Which basically, we're using cloud native to manage scale and complexity at speed and open sourcing it to make it easier for everyone else to become cloud native. So that's, the, that's your takeaway. Happy to connect to anyone on LinkedIn. I'll be around for the next few hours. Um, I'm afraid I have to wander off before the evening, but thanks very much. <laughs>